we've gathered here uh, for the first plenary of uh, the Cornet uh, Conference. Uh, today is the 22nd. I welcome you all. Uh, this has been quite a, a tough time for all of us to be in this together. For more than once at this, in this, in the past, I think, few weeks, we thought that uh, maybe now is not the best time to do this, but then we felt like, particularly as researchers were curiously, carefully looking at everything that's happening around us, probably there would not be a better time for us to gather and reflect on what's happening, everything that we've learned as a community in the past year and where we want to take this. So uh, here we are. Today we want to discuss uh, resilient health systems. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, I will quickly take you through some ground rules and then I'll pass it on to Priya. Great, we are recording this session for the purposes of documentation. Uh, we speak both in Hindi and English. So in case if you have comments or thoughts that you'd want to share in Hindi, please feel free to do that on chat or on the Q&A box. Uh, there is a Q&A box for your questions, uh, which, uh, which the speakers uh, are also looking at uh, constantly and also uh, a, a common stream in the chat section. So please feel free to use that. Um, and finally, I just wanted to emphasize that we are more than grateful for all the panelists who've been able to join us, for all of you to be here. Uh, we wanted to create this space that is a learning environment. So I'd request for all of you to uh, please act with uh, patience and kindness uh, and, and let's try to uh, make this as constructive as possible. Uh, I'd like to now introduce uh, uh, the moderators for this session uh, very quickly. Ayushi, can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, no, if you go up one more time, sorry. Great, uh, great. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Priya Nanda and uh, Dr. Krishna Rao who will be moderating this first opening plenary on resilient health systems. Dr. Nanda is a senior program officer at the Gates Foundation. Uh, where she leads measurement and evaluation for social norms and equity. Uh, she's previously been at uh, the International Center for Research on Women's uh, uh, Asia. And uh, also with her, we have uh, Dr. Krishna Rao, who's an associate professor at Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, I'll now pass it on to Priya uh, to speak with you a little bit about CORNET and the journey that we started in uh, May 2020. And uh, she'll also walk us through uh, the rest of the panel. Over to Priya. Um, thank you, Rohan. Um, so before I begin, I just want to very quickly introduce CORNET, uh, which is a network of 50 plus research organizations um, that came together literally last year around April, May of this time, because spontaneously a lot of organizations that were doing research post-COVID to trying to understand the implications of COVID on people's lives and food security, social protection, livelihood, gender, nutrition, um, kind of very organically started to get together into these virtual coffee hours that we set up and then got more formalized into a network where we um, helped, uh, you know, just nest a secretariat with quicksand to put together this community of practice and as uh, Rohan has said, over the last year, there have been, um, you know, many, many virtual coffee hours, many very interesting conversations on research, what we are learning on predicaments, challenges, ethics, and also a um, vibrant website where uh, we have created a data repository of the community of uh, partners who are part of CONED. This confer conference is anchored and put out together by this community of uh, um, researchers who are in this kind of loose network that we call CONET. Um, we about a, a couple of months ago had decided that we would give this as the frame for this conference. We wanted to have a conference one year post COVID to really take stock of where we are, what we've learned and uh, where do we go forward? What is the kind of dialogue and discourse and research that we need to have for more resilient uh, systems and therefore we kind of gave uh, ourselves the frame that we'll call this learning from resilience and resurgence um, but today as we have the opening plenary I would say for most of us in India this is a very sobering moment as we open the plenary it's a crisis of the pandemic that is so palpable in each of our lives right now again more I think than even ever before 
Um, our health systems, our providers are stretched beyond capacity. It's a crisis that I think none of us could have foreseen in its dimensions in all aspects. Um, so yes, we had chosen this theme on resilience. And I think it is so clear today as we are having this discussion that this is not just an intellectual conversation. I think it's a deeply emotional and personal conversation that we'll all be embarking on for the next hour and a half. Just um, kind of taking, stepping back and uh, thinking about what, what motivated us or what were we thinking about when we were talking about resilience. Um, uh, borrowing from some work that one of our partners, OPM, had been doing, it was really that health outcomes are affected not just by health systems, but also other connected public systems that impact the social determinants of health. And uh, as well as decisions that are made by individuals and households that operate in these complex systems and com communities that includes not just social determinants, but their trust of the system, the issues of social justice, rights, gender. So there is a whole set of issues that kind of uh, connect and it is intersectionality and there is interdependence. So health systems do not exist in isolation and they exist within this broader institutional governance and community systems. And I think today's conversation will talk about all of this. While resilience is often discussed in terms of how a system can absorb uh, shocks and I think there's a framework from, you know, absorption to adaptation to transformation of shocks and what we learn and how do we not return back but kind of build from here to go forward. I think while these discussions and frameworks are important, it's very important to understand what were the actual efforts that were happening in the last year and what do we really learn from them and how does that inform any of our conceptual thinking around resilience. So that's the conversation we're going to have today. It's really building out from the idea of uh, having a discussion around the innermost core, which is the frontline workers, to the broader health systems response, to the role of the private sector, and then really building it out to what does this mean for larger public health systems and institutional uh, governance. And lastly, a discussion at the global level uh, that should that would be rooted in dialogues of rights and social justice. So we have panelists who are going to kind of speak through that breadth of issues. Our first panelists, I'll just introduce them very briefly. They're probably very well known to all of you. So I'm not going to go into details of their bios. We have five panelists today. Dr. Rajni Ved is our first speaker. She's an advisor to the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Welfare Government of India and a former executive director at the National Health Systems Resource Center. Um, she is going to talk about the issue of frontline workers. And then we have Dr. Sridhar, who's a technical director at the Bihar TSU Care India. And he uh, also has been involved in the design, implementation, operational research, evaluation of a wide range of community health systems and public health initiatives. He is really going to speak about being deeply embedded in Bihar in the last year and also pre-COVID and COVID and now where are we today, you know, really bring his insights and learning both Rajni and he will be talking using the pre-COVID and the current lens. Ajay Mehel, Dr. Ajay Mehel is at the Nossal Institute of Global Health, University of Melbourne. He's a professor of health economics there. Previously, he was a... Uh, uh, the Allen and Elizabeth Finkel Chair of Global Health at the Monash University and also a faculty at Harvard uh, School of Public Health. Um, uh, then followed by Dr. Giridhar, who's with the Public Health Foundation of India and also has two decades of experience in public health research, practice and academics and has previously worked with the WHO. Uh, and lastly, Asha George, Dr. Asha George, who's with the School of Public Health, University of Western Cape, and has recently experienced another crisis of, uh, I think, uh, uh, this large kind of fire which took place uh, in, the, uh, in the environment of the university and took to the university, led to a lot, lot, big evacuation of students there. So sorry, but Asha is a qualitative researcher engaged in health systems to advance health and social justice in low and middle income countries. And she wears a strong gender and rights lens in almost all the work she does. 
Um, so this is our panelist. It's going to be a really interesting conversation. And with that, I now invite Rajni to please start. Uh, we'll have about 10 minutes for each panelist. I think we won't interrupt. We'll just keep going with the flow. And then I'll invite Krishna to bring in some of his comments and also open it up for a moderated discussion. Over to you, Rajni. So good afternoon, everybody. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to present. Um, this first slide really epitomizes the term resilience as I understand it. And I'm sure in the last year, there must have been like multiple definitions of resilience, what they mean to the health system. But for me, this particular slide, slide emphasizes two things. One, that the ASHAs, and when I say frontline workers today, my presentation is going to focus on the ASHAs. The ASHAs managed to continue doing what they were doing despite the adversity of COVID. And so you see here, there's specific tasks, whether it's weighing a newborn, whether it's taking a malaria slide, or whether it's doing wall writing to make people aware of this pandemic. The second, they were able to sustain their competencies under stress, both because of the knowledge they already had, but also because they took to the capacity building modules that were disseminated from the center in the state um, in with great enthusiasm. And in fact, wanted much more so that they could do their work for the pandemic uh, with much better effect. But really the question before us is how do community-based health systems and frontline workers recover after the adversity and the stress of a pandemic? And as Priya said, when the invitation to this meeting came, we had no idea that we would be in the middle of a surge like this. So it's, I also feel a little bit guilty about talking about after the pandemic when we are so much in the throes of one. But still, I guess in the interest of knowledge and learning and sharing, it behoves us all to at least be able to put out on the table what our own understanding of resilience and how particularly in my case, how frontline workers have, have performed, what were the, what were the pre-COVID conditions that enable them to perform and what we can look forward to. Can I have the next slide, please? So this really, I think most of you know, but I'm trying to put this in the context, the key features of the ASHA program in context of the pandemic. So as we all know, is a 15 year old countrywide government funded program. So in many aspects, a really mature community health worker program functioning at scale. It's an all women volunteer program there is community-led selection, and the ASHA is remunerated through a mix of financial and non-financial incentives. And all of these features have implications on considering her role in the pandemic, the fact that they were all women, that they were part of the community. And if one has to imagine the counterfactual or of if the ASHA were not there, how we would have been able to do the community-level interventions, the public health functions of the pandemic is really a question we should ponder. Um, it's largely a centrally funded program with decentralized planning and management. And this enabled district and sub-district program managers to reorganize and redeploy the ASHAs in order to best meet the needs of their particular contexts. Uh, there was a dedicated, there is a dedicated training and support system in place across most states. And that has really contributed to the ASHA's capacity and her skills and competencies. And I'd like to relate back to the first slide of how she continued to do the jobs that she was already doing. There is an affiliation, albeit variable, to community collectives such as the Village Health Sanitation and Nutrition Committees in rural areas, the Mahila Arogya Samitis in urban areas, self-help groups. Most ASHAs are members of local self-help groups and also elected representatives of local, uh, rural and urban local government. Um, but the reason I say this is, you know, we are too prone to think about frontline workers as individuals acting in their own agency and right. They do that, but they're also very deeply embedded in these community collectives. And I'll, I, I'll talk about this a, a little bit further on. Uh, there's now an evolving role of the member of the ASHA as a primary healthcare team member with the health and wellness centers in India. And so she works with the other frontline workers, the Anganwadi workers and the multipurpose workers. And what this did during COVID in those areas where the health and wellness centers were operational was they allowed um, very specific role allocation between team members. So moving away from an individual worker-based approach to a team-based approach. And that also helped to consolidate the work of the ASHA with the work of the first level facility. 
Low attrition, and the reason I say low attrition as a key feature of the program is that it's enabled most ASHAs to build substantial social capital, which in turn helped them during the pandemic and overcome some of the challenges that they faced. An uneven performance in urban areas, and I would like to say here, the exception is Delhi, because Delhi has had a long history of an urban ASHA program from 2005, but the uneven performance in urban areas meant that the community level responses to the pandemic were not as robust as we saw in the rural areas. Can I have the next slide, please? So what were the tasks of the ASHA during the pandemic? I think most of you know this. Contact tracing, risk communication, facilitating quarantine, undertaking surveys uh, for migrants and comorbidities and people with comorbidities so that they could be protected better. Focus on enabling non-COVID essential services, particularly uh, just after the lockdown, many times during the lockdown and in periods of restricted mobility, supporting facility access by getting permits for patients, by redeploying ambulances for both institutional delivery as well as, and equally for dialysis, because there is a good understanding now of the ASHA's role in chronic disease management, doorstep delivery of medicines for chronic disease patients, as well as supplying protective gear to communities. And what were the challenges she faced, both acute and persistent challenges? Number one was battling stigma and discrimination. And I, I think we need to do much more to understand what, they, what challenges they faced and how they actually dealt with it, the violence against the ASHAs. And this despite orders about punitive action would be taken, legal measures would be taken. But despite that in the field, and I think our grievance redressal mechanisms are not strong enough for the ASHAs to have been able to articulate this when these things happened. Second, and we heard about this too, lack of protective equipment, masks, sanitizers, etc. The third really is a double whammy. There was a reduction in payments, not just, not just because of delays and funds crunches, but also because most of the work the ASHA does is linked to tasks. And many of these activities she was not able to do during the lockdown. She was not able to do post lockdown because she was so occupied with pandemic related tasks. Sure, the government did make provision to give additional monies for the ASHA, but the payments were hugely delayed. And we're hearing reports from the field that in many states, these payments have still not been made and there are large backlogs in payment. So, Actually, this, the, I think the title is slightly wonky. It's the contribution of structures and processes in the ASHA system to respond to the pandemic. And I wouldn't even go so far as calling this resilience because it's very, very far from resilience, particularly if you look at the framework that uh, Priya had sent us. It's mitigation, adaptation. I just feel it's too early to be speaking about that. All I'd like to say is, what are the features that are there today that would help us to think about in the future, God willing, about how we could consider what mitigated, mitigation aspects there are, what adaptation and what transformation is possible from where we are today. So I think the first and most important is this whole issue of networks that the ASHA has built amongst themselves, a strong sense of solidarity with the health system, uh, with the primary healthcare system in particular, the ASHAs have a very strong relationship in most cases with other community platforms beyond the Village Health Sanitation Nutrition Committee and the MASS, um, including as elected representatives and as members of trade unions. The sense of solidarity, I think, is a very important feature going forward to enable us to think about possible adaptations and how to make the system more resilient. The second is the support structures that the ASHA has. And this is a very unique, I think, unique at this level of scale for the country is having ASHA facilitators, block, district, and state support mechanisms that have stood the ASHA in good stead during this period of the pandemic, whether it was um, enabling, listening even to grievances or enabling the supply of uh, kits and medicines to them, also addressing in as much as they could, the issue of payments. Uh, training and capacity building, I think we learned a very useful lesson here, which was the, uh, ability to do digital training. Now, it may not be the best option, but it was something that we had, we've embarked upon, and maybe this is something to continue in the future. Uh, provision of kits, and I, I, I just thought this would be useful to mention because of the ASHA's familiar, familiarity with using a digital thermometer um, or a timer to measure the baby's breathing, 
uh, or a weighing scale actually helped in uh, in cases where they had to do monitoring of temperature. It helped them in doing that. So I think giving the ASHAs many more point of care diagnostics is another way of looking at them, equipping them for the future. Um, role clarity. And why is this important? I think the time spent in the first five to seven years of the program in ensuring that the ASHA was truly community embedded. Today, there are many critics of the program who say she's lost her activist role. She's much more a part of the health system. And I'd like to say that in the early years of the program, the ASHA was very much community embedded. And I think that community embeddedness has helped her in building social capital and also in clearly distinguishing her or at least helping her overcome the dichotomy between being a community embedded worker and the link to the health system. And of course, she continues to be a strong link for the health system. And as I said before, the counterfactual is really uh, hard to imagine. Having, how would we have dealt with this pandemic without the ASHA being in place? The Anganwadi worker is there, but she's largely restricted to the Anganwadi center and looking at children zero to six and pregnant mothers and lactating mothers. Going house to house, undertaking those tasks would have been really difficult to imagine if we'd not had this frontline worker in place. And therefore I think, how do we look at, how do you make this community-based health system more resilient? How, do, how will their working conditions evolve and respond? And will the health systems, can, the, can we expect frontline worker resilience to contribute to health system resilience? Or is it that the health system really has to become much more robust and resilient, resilient for it to make sure that the frontline workers really have a good deal. Next slide, please. I think it's the end. Thank you. Thanks, Rajni. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to just seamlessly move to Sridhar and then only stop for comments at the end. Thanks, Priya and others and Rajni and for setting the tone uh, for how to think of resilience. Uh, I, I will basically try and uh, cover what uh, what what we are seeing as the system response to the crisis and not just in Bihar but beyond as well and uh, we're trying to understand the gaps in the system resilience using examples from the COVID but also reflecting on why on how these gaps are uh, demonstrated even in other times in peace times as well and uh, while it's on one hand, uh, I, you know, we should also not underestimate the amount of effort that the systems are putting in. Uh, sometimes misdirected, maybe, but huge amount of effort to actually respond. And I think we should we should acknowledge that it's it's true across the country. Uh, you know, because it's very easy in the midst of this unspeakable stress and grief to find fault. But uh, uh, there are heroes out there. There's a even at one level, the, our willingness to be the pharmacy of the world with drugs and vaccines, to Bihar, for example, being able to suddenly out of nowhere be able to do a, a 35,000 RT-PCRs daily. Uh, these are not ordinary achievements. So there are, it's, it's really good. The FLW resil resilience that Rajini spoke about. Um, and they were the ones who actually went house to house and did a lot. In fact, I should say that even Anganwadi workers have equally done the same thing even through the uh, pandemic because they've also uh, been told by the system to do uh, to, to go around and uh, either do contact tracing or whatever else. Uh, <clears throat> there are, uh, in addition, lots of creative initiatives we have seen, uh, the mostly by civil society, but also by, I would say, courageous individuals within the system. And there, you know, there are so many doctors and nurses who have not run away. There are examples of uh, you know, the district leadership bringing out the best in itself and uh, overall tales of tremendous fortitude and courage and generosity and heroism and whatever else. So there, it's, not been a, uh, it's, it's not been all negative in, in, in any sense of the word. Okay? But at the same, and also we know that we work pretty well in a crisis, the way that the whole system comes together and starts doing something. Uh, but what at the same time, uh, uh, we, there are there are there have been gaps, obviously glaring gaps, and let's look at some of them. I thought we should try and look and like look at some of them at different aspects of this response and identify a few questions or hypotheses in about in what manner and why systems might lack resilience, and uh, 
whether the, what the, the gaps that we are finding in the COVID response are reflected also in the routine in peace times. And uh, uh, essentially to ask if we, if we could have responded better, substantially better particularly, and why did we not? And maybe that will give us some understanding of whether there is something to do with systemic resilience, the lack of it. So just, just to take a few examples, uh, you know, and I'll take a few granular examples so that we, we, we get to the root of the, try and get to the root of the problem. At least I will try to do that. Um, so for example, how is this virus transmitted? Is it airborne versus droplet versus fomites? What's more important? And why indoor transmission is vastly more important than outdoor transmission? Um, when, when, you, when we know that there is such a glaring difference between indoor and outdoor transmission, why haven't we been communicating this more clearly? Especially in the second wave, it's become even more clear that this, this huge family clusters were getting infected within hours of each other and spending one night at home, doors and windows closed, the next day they emerge, all of them infected. When, when this is happening, why are we still communicating about don't go out? Why are we not saying be careful inside, for example? What, what is preventing us from actually changing this? Uh, uh, you know, why are we not talking more about ventilation and well-fitting masks rather than just saying any face cover and social distancing and hand sanitization, just the way we began. Ability to, you know, to, to bounce back, to learn, to adapt, to change. Uh, why is it that we are uh, taking so long to reverse policy, correct our communications? So is nimbleness to policy to program strategies, a quality of resilience that we lack? Is it something that we, we, we find difficult once a whole, once a, a, a system is set in motion, it, we find it difficult to overcome that inertia. And this is true of so many other uh, aspects of the health system. Too, too many rigid guidelines that we have to implement uh, so many programs and how we don't emphasize on adaptation and, uh, local learning. So this is this is one uh, area that I think we should be looking at as uh, a, you know, nimbleness. Uh, the second, I would say, is uh, about uh, you know, for example, look at oxygen. Okay, um, obviously it's a it's a tragedy. Now we we knew all the time that oxygen was needed. Maybe we never require, we, we did not anticipate it will require so much. Of course, nobody could anticipate this, the, the steepness of the second wave. But why did we not spend enough time trying to understand the engineering of air, the, 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 you know, the, the different aspects of it from, from the point of view of other disciplines? Where does oxygen come from? Where is it produced? How, what does it take to convert industrial into medical oxygen? Why did we wait until a second wave to learn this? Why did we not anticipate the migrant crisis and uh, what, what would have happened in, in the event of a lockdown to numerous? So these kinds of things, see, basically a lot of stuff, which uh, even the indoor transmission that I was talking about, um, uh, if, if we are able to understand in different indoor contexts, what is it that we need to tell different people? You have this kind of a house, so many people, how do you, how do you prevent transmission happening in your house if somebody is getting getting infected how much have we learned and how much have we translated made an attempt to you know uh, understand the social anthropological extra aspects and then translate that into so is it that because we medicos we, you know the old failing of we, we are not really trained to think beyond our uh, narrow silos and this ability to straddle disciplines is maybe that is what is lacking. Uh, is that why we are able not able to solve even simple problems? And that this also pertains to many, many. Why are we still talking about uh, early breastfeeding and complementary feeding in the 21st century, you know, third decade? Why, why did we not finish off this agenda earlier? Why are we not able to solve basic problems? Is it that we are too siloed in our approaches? Why are we not able to move from blunt tools to sharper tools as we learn? For, for example, you know, the amount of fear that this pandemic has generated and the lack of our, uh, our ability to tell people, look, so many things 
that we believe in are irrational. We have learned that it is irrational. Let's move on. Let's focus on sharper tools. We have, we have taught people to be absolutely scared of their own dear ones. We have, we have taught them to be scared of dead bodies, to believe that spraying dis disinfectant everywhere and anywhere will work, that face shields will work for everybody, uh, that it is sinful to you know, wear masks out, outside, outdoors, or not to wear masks out, outdoors. Why could we not just put all this away and say, okay, in the first few weeks of the pandemic, we have seen what, what works, what doesn't work. We know now. Let us put that away and, and move, move forward. This, because this conveys a very wrong message. Um, and let us assume that we did not know enough earlier, but did we not learn and could we not communicate that? Uh, are we afraid of communicating that we might be, we were wrong earlier? Is it something that's hardwired into us to say, to, to be unable to communicate that this is the basis of science, that falsifiability, I could be wrong yesterday, I can be more right today, and I can be wrong today, today which will not be true tomorrow. Why, this, why is it that we more easily, instead of doing that, why do we resort to the use of fear as a first resort in a crisis and to, 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 you know, to control people or whatever? Where does our trust in science go? Where is the data pilots? Uh, civil servants are extremely smart, we know that, but where is the science community in the decision-making? Look at Germany, you know, the Robert Koch Institute steps forward and says, this is what we'll do, and uh, Angela Merkel listens to them. It's, uh, look, at, look at CDC. Uh, in spite of Trump, they held, they, you know, they, they, they held forth. Where is our NCDC? And why is it that it's not visible? When we, I've been speaking to people in the NCDC. They know what is to be done. They know what the problems are. They, they, they are knowledgeable. They, they are nowhere to be seen. It's maybe there's just an old system failing that uh, affects all health programs. The, the bureaucracy takes over, or even the political class takes over. And this gets just more pronounced in a crisis. Can resilience be better built by trusting the methods of science? And how do we engender that culture in our systems? <clears throat> Moving to then, you know, for example, okay, we know what to do. We are doing it. Last mile challenges always remain. This is true across all programs, whether it is communicating effectively about uh, uh, COVID or uh, making sure that uh, somebody in a, a hospital gets oxygen at a particular rate steadily and gets monitored, uh, or you know, the, or, or the rest of the programs that we have. Neither supervision nor support to the last mile is something that we have ever emphasized adequately enough. Uh, isn't that a basic system failing? Isn't that what gives us the lack of resilience? If we if had if we had a culture by which people are expecting to be supported, supervised, being, being you, know, you know, helped, and their, their, their inputs are sought to improve the programs, improve interventions, so that becomes a virtuous cycle. Would that not make a very big difference? Uh, and finally, uh, is there, uh, for example, this crisis, how do we predict, can, how, how, how do we predict that this will end? Will there be any heads rolling for things that have gone really wrong? Will anything change really structurally? Will that structural change, if at all that happens, be linked to, uh, uh, to, to something, you know, to, to really improving the system inside out? I mean, we don't know. I don't want to kind of uh, pronounce a verdict in uh, advance. Let's wait. But typically, the analysis says, okay, it was implementation. For last mile, hang them first. If that not, okay, there's something went wrong with the system. Somebody did not supply this, that, et cetera. Only then, once all of that, we hardly ever go to the point of saying that maybe there was actually an intervention design failure or even a system design failure. Is this the way that our system should have been set up in the first place to respond? Who is going to be accountable to, 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 to failures and system design? So uh, this ability to introspect and to re reform, how do, we, how do we get that into systems? And, would that make the systems more resilient? I'll stop here. There's just a few examples that I thought I'll just take and reflect on it. And these apply practically to all other programs that we have seen um, and all other uh, you know, routine work in the health programs as well. Uh, in a crisis, they become more pronounced, of course. I'll stop here. Thanks a lot, Sridhar, for bringing up some really important constructs of nimbleness learning, trust, 
in science and proactive communication. I think all very, very important. Um, Ajay, um, I'm going to just pass the baton on to you to take it from here. And let me begin by thanking both Priya and Rohan and, and the core group for inviting me for this uh, gathering. I think I'm really looking forward to this. Frankly, I haven't thought about resilience a whole lot. So I think it was very educational for me to, uh, to hear uh, both Dr. Ved and Sridhar about what's going on in India at the moment uh, in the COVID arena. It does not sound good and I really feel for what's going on. So what I thought in my, uh, the, the perspective I'm going to take is going to be somewhat different, partly because I'm not there in India at the moment. So I am not sort of going to focus specifically on COVID, although I will keep coming back to it. Uh, I'm going to take a sort of a much more macro perspective on the subject of resilience. And to teach myself a little bit, I found this somewhat interesting paper. Uh, it is of course based on data from Austria, no less, on how to understand resilience in primary healthcare systems. And now this particular paper, um, what it did was to ask what happens if a, a system, a network, a collection of providers uh, spread in a, in, over, a over a geography is hit by either large numbers of people seeking care or some providers or groups of providers simply vanishing and, and leading to behavior changes and so forth in response. And I think while the finding is somewhat pedestrian, for me, what it brought to light are a few things that ought to be important when we begin discussing questions around resilience. Uh, in particular, the idea that it, it's not as if we need to think of resilience as an all or nothing thing. In fact, there may be areas the system does very well, some geographical regions and others where we don't do as well. I think trees are pointed to Bihar responding and that may very well be an interesting case of the system responding well, but there could be other areas where the health system may not respond as well. So the first thing I learned from this work was the importance of not looking at a whole country or a whole region or a whole continent, but to look at specific weak links in the chain, even thinking about uh, the, the notion of resilience. The second thing I learned was the, the issue of balancing resources with ensuring capacity to respond, which I'm going to call resilience for the moment. So yes, if you spend a lot, of, a lot of money, you may be able to quote unquote, buy some degree of resilience in some areas. Uh, but of course, as we have seen in the examples of Italy and even France and, and other countries that it doesn't, in Brazil, for example, even these systems, which are pretty well resourced, uh, can come a cropper when dealing with a very significant epidemic. And perhaps the most sort of important message for me was data. I mean, I'm a data person. And I think for me, the driving message from this work was, you know, the starting point for a good discussion on resilience or for the matter, any, any policy in a relevant discussion is a good database to work with. Uh, this is something we often lack in India. And I think this is something that, that's going to be important going forward. Next slide, please. But it's not simply about the supply side. It's not simply about doctors, nurses, ASHA workers, informal care providers, and so on. Uh, resilience also has to do with human beings who actually need care. Uh, what do I mean by this? You may not find any pressure on the system. For example, if people never get to the system to use their services. So here is some data from the uh, from a survey that we did at Nossal Institute with NCR in Delhi, in, in um, Odisha, and in UP. And this is a telephone survey, as you can imagine. It was done in October last year. And what's striking, if you look at these numbers, and uh, in fact, the only thing I would ask you to look at is the stuff in red, which means you know, something uh, which is a big problem. And what we can see is people highlighting a whole range of factors uh, that influence their seeking healthcare. Funding, lack of access to providers, fear of getting infected, finding someone to go with them. We also may have a fear of getting infected and transportation, all of which are likely to be impacted by the epidemic. So it's not simply a question of providers existing or available. Uh, but it's also a whole range of other factors that are also going to come in. And I'll, you know, my last slide in this presentation will, in fact, revisit this issue, issue. Next one, please. Now, any system, and I think we have seen certainly India getting challenged 
But even, I mean, if you look at the example of Italy and Brazil, any system, if hit with a large enough shock, will collapse. Resilience is not unlimited. So in some sense, I would argue that when thinking about resilience, it shouldn't always be about a system's capacity to respond, but also things that have to be done before the system gets affected. So here I really mean a limiting exposure to risk. Be it, uh, so whatever, be it earthquakes, be it you know, some AMR uh, uh, bug, be it uh, uh, the COVID uh, crisis or the tsunami and so forth. And what this means is that we need to th be thinking carefully about uh, reducing or at least advanced warning surveillance systems, regulatory requirements, building codes, for example, for earthquakes. One health approach is the idea of marrying animal health questions with human health uh, decision-making processes and so forth, and, and, and a broader climate change issue as well. So I think we need to be thinking much more broadly uh, from this perspective, not just human health or, or the health sector, narrowly speaking, but in a much more broad way. Of course, it doesn't mean that you have to do for everything, but certainly it does mean that one has to think about coordinating across sectors. And that of course raises its own challenges. But I think if we can't think about those things now, when are we ever going to think about these sorts of questions? The second issue is, okay, fine. The, if you can sort of advance warning, reduce initial risk, but also I think one should have mechanisms in place that involve responding to secondary shocks. That is once a shock has hit, so stopping it early, mitigating if you will. And here I think um, this, is, this is about, you know, information getting transferred to the relevant people, people having incentives to provide that information, people having incentives to receive it and to act upon it. All these are important questions, which I'm sure you know, are becoming quite apparent in, this, in the COVID scenario, but also they've been sort of dealt with and experienced in India and other settings. For example, the tsunami of 2004 or the NEPA, uh, uh, I shouldn't call it epidemic, but certainly the NEPA crisis in Kerala in 2018. And certainly those are reasonably effective examples. I mean, sitting again, sitting in Australia and America in both those occasions, uh, I am not as aware of exactly what happened, but certainly there may be important lessons to be learned from how we can actually have secondary line of defense if in fact the initial line of you know, simply surveillance and advance warning uh, somehow uh, falls apart. So I think what I want to sort of conclude this slide with is just noting two things, that we're not talking simply about a health centric perspective going forward. I mean, it's too late to be thinking about COVID right now, but certainly going forward, one should be thinking about much more broad uh, cross sector approaches of course, it can't be every sector to every sector, but certainly to the extent possible, thinking broadly, not narrowly. And then also that raises issues about coordination. That's a well-known, for an economist, a well-known problem, but we leave that to the experts later on. And next slide, please. And what of absorptive capacity? I mean, we talked about, we, we, we often speak of resilience as being the capacity to absorb. How, how, how effective, is the system in, is the system currently in absorbing um, uh, shocks? Now, certainly I think uh, what we heard from Regini was, I think, frankly, quite frankly, I mean, I was very amazed by the response, uh, thanks to the ASHA workers at the village level. I think that's quite fantastic. But we also heard from Sridhar about some of the challenges in terms of absorbing the, the challenges posed by COVID. Um, I'm surprised, uh, certainly, I mean, the ASHA ex experience is quite dramatic, but I thought I'll take us back a little bit uh, to what's happening elsewhere and what's happened in the past. Now, if you recall, when, I mean, uh, some years back when, when, when NRHM was in full flow, there was a Janani Suraksha Yojana. And one element of that was to provide funding uh, for, for people to give birth in public facilities so that they could move from you know, private providers or other uh, you know, just giving birth at home to public facility institutional deliveries. And what was found uh, in this study was that despite the move uh, to public facility inst institutional deliveries did not really result in a decline in neonatal mortality. And that's because once they did move to these facilities, they didn't have the capacity, quote unquote, to absorb the influx of new patients, nor did they have the capability uh, that, that was required in the labor room. So certainly I think there, is, there are challenges linked to absorptive capacity and those are apparent quite long time back. So it's not as if COVID has brought new insights to the issue. If anything, I was very impressed by hearing about the ASHA experience, but certainly 
they've had these long-standing challenges. And then I found this article in the New England Journal of Medicine published just this year, I think, uh, which was on, on the Indian response, uh, well, the response by the Tata Memorial Hospital to cancer cases. And I think what this highlights is the issue of uh, patients with chronic conditions. I think the key challenge here is that in many chronic condition cases typically get access to services not at the village level, but in hospitals and, and, and in specialists and so forth who are not going to be accessible. So in, in, for these cases, the challenges of absorption are much, much more significant. Next slide, please. So how does one sort of respond to all of this? My position is that in fact, for a country that's been spending 1% of thereabouts of GDP for the longest possible time that I have known, at least in the early 90s, I think it's very hard uh, for the system to develop resilience without an additional influx of resources. I think uh, if we don't deal with that question, uh, we are going to be really putting a lot of stress on our health workers and also, also the population at, at large. Uh, linked to this, of course, I think, uh, again, this is linked to what uh, Rajini had said earlier on, that we need to think about healthcare services to be much closer to the people. The ASHA is a fantastic example of that. But also to think about how we can take care of our chronically uh, chronic, patients with chronic conditions, how they can get access to services, even if they are not accessing hospitals and specialists and so forth. And that sort of leads us to questions around decentralization, improved capacity of you know, primary healthcare workers, uh, additional skills in the area of chronic conditions, uh, and broader decision making capacity. After all, at some level, it's the decision making capacity that can enable. Uh, people to respond to crises on their own rather than waiting for orders uh, from more centralized authorities. Final slide, please. Let me just add by one final thought. I began with a focus on in inputs and I moved quickly to the issue of um, you know, consumer response. I think without, uh, certainly it's important that we have uh, strong health sector resources and supporting health sector workers and so forth. But I don't think we'll get very far if we also don't address the question of financing on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the household side. People will have to be able to afford health services. They should be able to afford transportation. They should have funds for meeting their basic human needs. Otherwise, we won't have much by way of resilience except in a purely technical sense that people don't reach healthcare providers. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ajay. Um, I invite uh, Giridhar Babu to please begin. Uh, hello, everyone. Building uh, resilient surveillance platforms or systems based on the existing one, this is the uh, topic that I would want to discuss. Uh, you all know the definition of One Health. Uh, it really integrates uh, the surveillance and ensuring that there is health achieved at an ecological level, looking at animals, plants, human beings, and how each of these ecosystems interact with each other. So if you were to follow this, why should we do this? If that uh, I can answer and then go to the next slides. <clears throat> and nearly 85% of all the diseases that we'll have to tackle uh, in our lifetime now, from now onwards will be zoonotic diseases. And without actually looking at one health approach, I will not be able to tackle uh, not just the COVID-19, but also the uh, diseases that <clears throat> are going to be uh, uh, problems in the future. So uh, as if now, at least the developed world uh, is looking at in terms of one health approach, and they also have some indicators in terms of how these systems are interacting with each other. How do we position India's uh, surveillance system towards one health? So just to give you in terms of uh, the ambit and the spectrum of what all we need to consider if we were to follow one health approach, so uh, there is uh, individual health and uh, from the earlier talks of uh, Dr. Ajay and everyone else, uh, even with respect to individual health, we have not been able to focus completely well. Population health is completely neglected. I'm actually speaking of one more aspirational step of ensuring uh, ecosystem health. So therefore, uh, given the ambit and spectrum of all these domains, how are we going to focus on One Health? So the interaction between animals, the vectors and the human beings, and in terms of what are the routes of transmission, uh, we have uh, had so many discussions.
through the COVID-19 uh, pandemic response. Uh, some of the things are not settled even now. But uh, this is very important for us to understand how uh, the ecosystem actually functions in the first place. And uh, we do not have uh, detailed studies in India regarding that. I wouldn't want to bore you with details of each routes of transmission and which diseases will spread. But then it might suffice to say that we should be looking at each of these uh, routes of transmission, understand how the uh, diseases are affecting uh, the ecosystem. So if we were to prevent another pandemic, if we were to uh, detect uh, a outbreak in the early stage, how do we do that? And uh, how do is our systems capable of uh, detecting it? And what kind of messages will then have to position based on that? Uh, I'll not go into the details of each of these, but let me just begin from looking at how do we prioritize One Health within India? So if we were to detect and respond to any pandemics in future, we should be able to detect rapidly and ensure that it doesn't spread faster. And we will have to make sure that not many people get uh, either infected or even get into severe illness. The control measures, whatever we have done in terms of uh, reactive uh, response, uh, sometimes I feel we are more lucky than uh, even just the group uh, regrouping and all the energetic measures that we take as part of the reactive measures. With the second wave, we know how terrible it has been. Then how do you contain the outbreaks when they uh, occur? And after a, an outbreak is gone, what is the impact on our systems? How do we evaluate it? And what is the long-term trend that we need to monitor? Uh, as of now, there are many initiatives uh, about One Health within uh, the country, starting from uh, the National Standing Committee on Zoonosis of the Ministry. Uh, there is ICMR, ICAR uh, collaboration on One Health. There is National Influenza Pandemic Committee of the Ministry. We also have uh, wonderful work done at uh, PHFI and uh, on the uh, zoonosis and this has been uh, very well lauded by uh, globally how the entire database was created and how it could be scaled up the rabies control initiative not just in tamil nadu but in the entire country and dbt's one health roadmap uh, given that all these programs exist how do we move forward so in order to do that, I'll uh, probably look into uh, these headings. The first and foremost is, uh, is the policy uh, focus is on One Health or what kind of priority do we give in terms of uh, implementing One Health approach? So as of now, uh, it's my personal opinion that whenever we look at uh, any of the initiatives, it's mostly uh, driven by the uh, impending challenges so if there is a second wave now, we will tackle second wave and later on something else, and then we'll only tackle that. So uh, one is vertical systems. Second is these, uh, our limited focus on a, a very transient period. Therefore, anything that is long-standing, anything that is integrating either horizontally or vertically gets lost in the process. So this is time for us uh, to look at uh, whether we can reorient the policy focus to not just uh, managing COVID-19, but also prevent such pandemics in future. But we have to begin somewhere. So uh, how does the existing surveillance system uh, speak to uh, in terms of uh, you know, being remodeled into something aspirational as One Health? Uh, we should again look at the kind of data uh, that we have and how do we treat the data. Uh, with whatever we have in the public domain, uh, there is very limited inference that uh, I, a public health community or researchers can make out and then you end up having some limited uh, impact from them uh, contributing to the policy. Um, and with a lot of hesitation, I say that there is no culture for data transparency. We hold our data 
um, in in closets we don't want to reveal we don't want to share we don't want to collaborate and that doesn't limit only to the governments it's also many other sectors that are involved uh, where data transparency does not exist as of now just to give you an example uh, as of now we do not know uh, what is the proportion of mortality uh, as a result of covid-19 and non covid illness and what is the total mortality or excess proportion and this is uh, a really a loss that even uh, in the height of the pandemic we don't know what its uh, impact is so uh, we have to understand we have to respect the way it is and then say uh, okay how do we change this system uh, i'll just give another example of how data systems speak within india so uh, we have to promote data Uh, transparency and have to make sure that uh, some of we build a culture of uh, uh, these data from different agencies talking to each other and not just from the health de- department but also if we are talking in terms of one health we'll have to integrate several departments and several sectors and finally uh, the, the important aspect that we have to consider is equity i feel uh, inability to uh, reflect data from a one particular region uh, actually is a uh, uh, major problem for people from that region because let's say if i am not reporting mortality from one region we are actually uh, not giving enough respect to the people there their uh, life doesn't get reflected doesn't get respected so if uh, we don't focus on equity then it's a major loss but if we are to begin somewhere let's look at the global level there is global health security index which looks at several parameters on pandemic preparedness it blew off really badly uh, when it came uh, in predicting how well the countries responded uh, if you see what's uh, in blue that is the global health security rank and if you see how the covid-19 response in orange color these did not correlate with each other the best ranked ones uh initially did not manage the covid uh, response at all uh, really well at all so that means uh, these indicators are not really objective maybe there is a subjective element of leadership coordination collaborations which don't get reflected there look at our own uh, indian uh, surveillance platforms you would see there are multiple surveillance programs speaking uh, within themselves and they don't talk to each other if you were to create a dashboard of sorts of all the data that comes in uh, we simply don't have sometimes we have the duplication of data that comes from uh, different programs uh, ultimately as rajni ma'am was rightly saying the maximum load is on the frontline workers in terms of having to collect the data for all these vertical programs so we haven't been able to uh, make uh, an attempt in integrating all this although there are several efforts have been done in the past but we have not met with that success given that uh, focus is on integrating these platforms uh, how do we then uh, integrate uh, several aspects of uh, surveillance that we need to focus on um, th- these are few slides which will uh, i'll just uh, go through the headings uh, we do not have a system for collecting uh, death related data so there has to be mortality surveillance uh we haven't been able to integrate electronic reporting systems that we need to focus uh surveillance in the wildlife and how do we integrate that within the human uh, disease surveillance that we have to focus uh in during covid-19 response we saw how digital uh, surveillance was useful in quarantine and also in ensuring isolation and all the uh, aspects related to the covid-19 response so therefore there is an important aspect of integrating digital tools in the overall covid-19 response and the other one health approach as we move ahead uh without digital health and integrating into our surveillance platforms we will not be able to do uh, a justification to one health approach this is my uh, final slide while doing that we have to ensure that we don't cater to just one particular uh, age span of the life course but uh, how do we integrate through the life course starting from uh, birth till the adult life and uh, 
and and uh, late adulthood so uh, with that pers- with that perspective i live with the thought that currently our systems do not have uh, enough uh, strength and resilience to tackle another pandemic if we were to reorient our systems we need to be looking at these aspects and where do we begin uh, which agency will be the nodal agency to start with uh, do we just go back to the same old uh, style of uh, doing surveillance or should we change the gears and directions uh, this is just a, a thought and a time for introspection thank you thank you for bringing up some very important points including um, you know systems essentially include data and data surveillance if we are really trying to control the pandemic so given the deficits that we are working with and ajay pointed out that too um it's very difficult to talk about resilience so thank you i think some very sobering thoughts there um asha over to you um you going to take us zoom us out a little bit from india but we are curious to hear what you will bring to us from a global perspective as well as of course your own knowledge of having worked in india intimately prior to that in karnataka over to you thank you so much priya and i'm delighted humbled and honored to be part of this discussion so i'm going to reflect on my experience um a few things i've learned by co-convening a research prioritization process on gender and covid-19 with you and you iigh as well as some lessons on community responses um to covid-19 from cape town where i'm based at the moment in doing so i want to first uh, maybe we can go to the next slide have a few caveats i am a professor in public health with a lot of um uh, decades of work on gender and health but it's impossible to touch base on all the aspects of gender and covid-19 um the initiative has developed five different thematic reports touching on from the biomedical to the clinical to the structural and political so i'm going to pick out just two key factors from that work to spark discussion and while i've been based at the university of the western cape for the last 5 years even 5 years is not enough to speak authoritatively about the the history the conte- contextual nuances of post apartheid south africa um so i'm really drawing on the experiences of other people here um but i hope the inputs will contribute to the discussion So already several speakers Ajay Giridhar has already mentioned that health systems resilience is in, depends on how inclusive a key part of resilience is how inclusive it is of key actors in the system and Rajni mentioned Asha workers and their critical role um but also all the other sectors um and covid-19 has really brought that to the fore but do we even know who is counted can we go to the next slide um one thing that's striking and these are the gender elements of the pandemic are not things that were unknown um those of us who have been working on women's health gender and health issues the call for sex disaggregated data is a call that is 30 years old um and it is striking today um that it is still a call that needs to be made so sarah hawks in a commentary in the lancet this this um a few weeks ago um again brought this out um and i think when the pandemic broke out there were there was a lot of conjecture are men more affected women more affected just getting access to the data has been a challenge um they note that in 2020 four out of 10 cases and three out of 10 deaths globally are reported with no mention of sex which really hampers us from having as given the said having the data to know how to best respond this data in terms of sex is recorded but it's simply not reported or done so in a timely manner um so i think this is a key part if we want to have health resilient health systems we need to do be much better in how we manage data collect it be transparent about it and communicate it uh, in a timely manner Can we go to the next slide? Um so I started at the very bottom who's affected? 
who 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 is being affected by the um, the pandemic? Do we know? At the very now, going to the other continuum to the very top, who, who's at the decision making table? And again, this is not um, something new for those of us who were working in gender and health, but COVID nineteen has made it even more pressing. Um, there was a commentary in BMJ Global Health that really last year pointed out that only 3.5% uh, of the COVID-19 decision-making and task forces they could track had gender parity. Most of them were dominated by men. And um, I would um, recommend that you visit the UNDP COVID-19 response tracker. It's a very helpful um, database. They report that globally, only 24% uh, of COVID-19 task forces have women on them. This drops to 15% for Asia. So we don't have, we don't, we could do better in terms of who's being counted and also who's being included in the decision making. Does this matter? Can we go to the next slide? So the same um, COVID-19 response tracker did an analysis, and I know Global 5050 has recently uh, released a similar report. Out of the 3,000 uh, 3, policy measures that they tracked across all countries, less than half of the policy me measures um, for COVID-19 had any information or had any consideration um, for gender issues. Um, uh, at least 27%, I think this is good, given what we know about the effects of the pandemic, and the huge increase in um, um, the implications for violence against women, as women were restricted, lived under lockdown, with less access to services, often with um, the abusers in their own households, who were also going under economic strain. There are multiple factors that led to this. At least 20, I think it's good, but not enough that at least there was some recognition that violence against women needed to be addressed. What's striking to me is that since women bore the brunt, most women are already more likely to be in the informal sector, um, but there was so little recognition of their vulnerability and um, little response to social protection or labor market measures that address women's economic security since they were the first that were hard hit by the pandemic. And then we know that women have been, have borne the brunt of the pandemic in terms of school closures, looking after childcare, looking after the sick, um, all the work that Rajini has mentioned of the ASHA workers who are a volunteer, but at least somewhat formalized um, cater. Only 6% of the policy measures paid any attention to um, unpaid care, uh, which I think is atrocious. Uh, next slide. So it does matter who's at the decision-making table um, and we, we need to be, do much better. I'm going to go ahead and just um, end with two slides on the experience of COVID-19 in Cape Town. So I'm not speaking for all of South Africa, um, but there are some interesting um, experiences here in terms of community responses. Now, South Africa, just like India, is a middle-income country with huge social inequalities. And Cape Town is emblematic of those social inequalities. Um, it has, um, I'm pausing, I don't want to get distracted. I'm just pausing because there's so much beauty and wealth in Cape Town, but also depravity and inequality. But what was striking is in March 2020, when lockdown ensued, uh, we couldn't leave our, even our houses. We were only allowed to leave to get food or health care. That had huge implications for people's livelihoods. So the need for self-organized neighborhood groups was recognized early on. And a lot of informal self-organizing happened because we government just couldn't respond to the social implications of the lockdown. Um, so a toolkit of how to create these, um, what were key principles in developing these self-organized neighborhood groups was um, uh, shared online. And in the space of two months, over 170 of these neighborhood action networks were created. Um, from Kailicha, which is an informal 
uh, settlement neighborhood that's very densely uh, populated to the wealthiest neighborhood, Constantia. Uh, everyone brought, came together to create a, a, a can, and there was a lot of crosstown solidarity. They developed their own agendas of what was locally needed, and also what, how could we cross neighborhoods to support, how could a wealthy suburb in Constantia link up with hands in less um, uh, fortunate neighborhoods to address basic needs. So my time is up, but I want to go to the next slide. There's so much to share and as always little time. But the key lessons from this experience is it really the, and I think this has implications for resilience. A lot of the spontaneous and sustained work of these community action networks in addressing access to water, access to food, um, developing, for instance, uh, some of the um, health information pamphlets on, uh, just go previously um, on um, the previous slide, on uh, whether you should use masks well ahead of WHO, how should you use transport, all of that happened because of personal, interpersonal relationships. It was really an informal network and emphasizing on the importance of trust. And that allowed it to move very quickly sometimes because of trust. And when things were unclear to slow down, to have that flexibility, to make, make sure your bottom denominator was to ensure trustful relationships. There was a lot of um, boundary spanning. So there were, there was informal recognition by the state. Health officers and health officials sat in on the learning Zoom calls between neighborhood CANs and were involved in the initiative. And in that sense, I think it broke some of the things in terms of what knowledge is valued from whom. It was not only health officials and health workers who lived in those neighborhoods that participated and played that boundary spanning role. They learned from communities, but communities had a lot to learn about the constraints of government and a recognition of who are community leaders, not the formal structures, but really who are the actors on the ground. So I think this puts us, the last slide is really, and I really feel uh, India is in the middle of this. Um, and it's hard when you're in the middle of a crisis to think of how to change gears, but it's absolutely imperative. And Peter Drucker is the father of modern management. He said, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence itself, but to act with yesterday, yesterday's logic. And I think that to me sums up really what resilience is about. How do we rethink how we do this? And Keith, who's the provincial health director here, has always been clear that COVID-19, yes, is a crisis, but it's a huge opportunity to do things differently and we can't afford not to. So that's the link to um, where some of the discussions on gender and COVID-19 is happening. And uh, look forward to further questions. Thank you. Thanks, Asha. Um, also to bring very important points around the power of the community and the collective and the no local knowledge and systems of knowledge that get embedded, embodied in communities. I think that's really important and how much we have used that and we have relied on that at this time. So over to you, Krishna, please come uh, in with your comments, and then I hope there will be at least one round of discussion that we can manage between all of the panelists. Over to you, Krishna. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, <clears throat> Priya. Uh, I have the difficult task of summarizing and uh, offering comments on this wide range of presentations. This wide range of excellent presentations, I should say, that covered a whole range of topics on the issue of resilience uh, and also how it probably relates to the COVID situation in and elsewhere. Uh, we heard from uh, Sridhar and Rajini about the importance of uh, the government's role in achieving resilience. Um, and then from uh, Giridhar Babu, Ajay and Asha about being more inclusive in how we think about resilience. Uh, so for example, Ajay, asked us to think more broadly, not narrowly. Giridhar, his presentation was on looking at resilience from a One Health perspective, and Asha was just talking to us about the importance of gender. Um, so 
when looking at this diversity of, of, of thoughts on resilience, it might be good to uh, step back and, 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 and see how we define it. Uh, for me, resilient health systems has to do with the ability of a health system to scale up responses uh, to crises as they occur uh, without uh, compromising on routine uh, service delivery, and this is the sort of standard definition uh, that one sees in the literature. Um, but I also think it's important to think about resilience um, in the context of the type of health system that a country has. So for example, uh, if we take India's health system, for instance, um, India has a highly pluralistic health system. You have a multiplicity of uh, healthcare providers, systems of medicine, uh, being practiced. So many of them are informally trained. You have high-end corporate private providers, but you also have the government. You have a multiplicity of medical systems being practiced. You have aromatic medicine, Ayush, homeopathy, um, you know, naturopathy, and so forth. So what does it mean to think about resilience in a health system like this? And is it even achievable? Um, I think uh, it's important, one, to recognize that in India's health system, the government really is a, is, is, a, is one of the many players, and in fact, in many areas, not the major player. So for example, if you look at uh, the provision of outpatient visits, uh, you would see that, uh, that most of outpatient visits are provided by, by the non-state sector. Uh, for hospital care also to a large extent, you see that. Of course, there's variation across states and not all states uh, have this, but the, by, by and large, that's what we see in the country. Um, so how can resilience be achieved in, in, in a context like this? And I think that is the, uh, the sort of challenge that several of our speakers uh, were trying to uh, speak about. Um, so in, from my perspective, achieving resilience in a, in a highly pluralistic health system like India uh, can only happen if there is strong government stewardship or engagement with all actors in the health system. Um, I think, um, as Asha pointed out, that the COVID crisis in India, uh, while being a crisis, also is an opportunity. And I think in that respect, uh, the, the, the way the COVID crisis has, has brought out the interactions between the government and the private sector, I think it opens us up uh, to thinking about about the opportunities uh, in this sort of engagement. So for example, um, uh, you know, there were issues with how, how do COVID beds get allocated? Uh, how, how much control does the government have over, over, over COVID beds, for example, in the private sector? And the government uh, regulate the prices of COVID treatment in the private sector. Uh, if you look at vaccinations too, uh, the, both the major vaccines being offered in India are being produced by private sector companies. And so there, there has to be, and there is a lot of negotiation between the government and them. Uh, similarly, you see for oxygen supplies, um, if you look at the primary healthcare space, uh, the majority of primary health care, primary care providers in many of India states are, are non-state providers, they are private, they work in the private sector, many of them informally trained, and yet there is very little uh, And so just to uh, summarize my main point, um, uh, it's extremely important, uh, especially when fighting a pandemic and otherwise too, uh, for a resilient health system to be inclusive of all the different actors uh, that operate in it. Uh, but more importantly, I think there needs to be uh, a, a much more proactive role of government in, in, in having stewardship over the health system. And there are ways to achieve it, for example, through financing um, and other means. Um, I'll stop here now because I hope uh, there are several questions that uh, are there for our panelists. Um, and. Uh, uh, we can, uh, I also see that many of them are answered. Um, so let me, let me start by asking uh, one of my own. Uh, and maybe uh, uh, I will start with uh, asking Ajay. 
since uh, he is speaking to us from Australia, and also mentioned the fact that many of the uh, wealthier countries' health systems were uh, were uh, sort of uh, overwhelmed by the COVID pandemic. Um, so uh, my question to you, Ajay, is um, is when you see that happening in these health systems that were held up as examples of strong health systems, right? What went wrong there? And what lessons uh, do those health systems offer to countries like India uh, that are, uh, say, trying to build more resilient health systems? Great question, uh, Krishna. If I knew the deep insights about it, I could probably answer it uh, very well. But I think two things come to mind. I think one is what I would call complacency, the idea that it can never get that bad. So I think at some level, it's it's that. And the other thing is, I think, is such an uncertain event that it's hard to predict. It's a moving target almost. So I think the systems, although they're quite capable of handling small sh shocks to the system, large ones, which are highly correlated, unpredictable, et cetera, I think are, are going to be hard to handle. I mean, look, I mean, at some level, what has really saved the goat is the is the is the vaccine, uh, for, uh, the, the the vaccine development. Otherwise, I think systems around the world would be in serious trouble. This is what my take on this is. Thanks, Arta. Do you want to offer? Yeah, I I, I also think um, governance is absolutely key. And if you look at the response uh, in the U.S. and the U.K., you can't ignore the role of. Um, political parties and um, their, uh, and I think Ajay mentioned, one of the speakers mentioned this, whether they listen to public health or science, uh, who's at the decision-making table. Um, and I think what was key here, there are many, in South Africa, it's, we've had many challenges, but the president was on TV every two weeks, briefing the nation, um, giving updates. Um, you know, if you can't institute a lockdown, with such massive social implications without, uh, it's a sort of with some kind of humility. And I know that's every country has a different political trajectory. I'm not going to comment on the situation in, in India, but I think um, we can't ignore the role of that ma macro level politics. And especially when you look at what's happened in the UK and the US and the role that that played. Another comment that, that, that struck me while I was listening to the presentations was Sridhar's comment or, uh, or, his, uh, or his plea for accountability, uh, uh, that some, there must be accountability somewhere uh, for what is happening. So I was interested in the, in the notion of accountability that, that Sridhar had, had brought up, right? That someone needs to be accountable uh, uh, for achieving resilience. Uh, and so I was thinking, what I mean, how how might that be built built in, right? How do you how do you create that sort of accountability uh, um, in in our say in, in India's health system? Asha, do you? No. So I, uh, there are others. There's Girda Rohan would have. Uh, oh, they're okay. currently based in the Indian health system. One reflection I have is that. The way you pose the question makes it think like there's one big accountability structure. And I think what we've learned from resilience, it's how you bring a network of actors together. And therefore, there's each one has an accountability to be part of this learning network, to be able to think critically, respond, be flexible. And because of the uncertainty, um, the ways of doing business before have gone out the window. So how do you collaborate um, um, together? So it, it's almost like a series of micro accountabilities of, that brings in and facilitates the, uh, each actor um, in putting into the system. But over to others who are embedded in the current context in India. Thanks. Well, let me quickly put in my two cents worth. I think uh, the challenge I have as an economist trained in economics for 30, 40 years is to visualize how we sort of coordinate multiple sort of incentive driven individuals and groups. I don't think it's an easy task. Usually it's crises that allow these sorts of things to emerge. So I think if with a crisis like COVID, this is perhaps really our best opportunity to think systematically about developing 
some sort of a resilient framework. If it's gone, I can assure you, we'll be back to business as usual. Okay, there. It's a tough one, <clears throat> Krishna, but uh, I can uh, replay the question and answer from uh, yesterday's press conference regarding second wave. One of the journalists asked, what are the reasons for second wave? What led to this and who is accountable? And the answer was, it's not time for us to look into that. Right now, we just need to respond. We will address that later. And when it comes... Uh, later, and if you really look at that, then probably there are some learnings that we can incorporate. But that time will probably never come. Especially it will not come if the accountability is at a higher level. And accountability at lower levels are always easy to implement and then we give more and more work to them. So I, I have a, a very a difficult uh, experience of uh, you know fixing the accountability and that should probably start with uh, ourselves first. I mean, I should start from my level. That's it. Thank you. It's actually a very nice answer, I should say. Uh, uh. <laughs> I just wanted to kind of bring up the issue of trust because several speakers mentioned trust. And I feel like, isn't that like almost the shadow side of accountability? or or at least another dimension and the other part of it is we also talked about opaqueness of data at the time of crisis and not having enough data to make scientific proactive immediate responsive decisions so how do we how do we manage this lack of trust opaqueness of data how, uh, aren't these important dimensions of accountability? Because accountability just doesn't happen. It exists in a system where all of these parameters exist. Uh, I, I'll probably take an initial crack at this. And sort of uh, my sort of view on these things is that they're going to be very hard to do. I think part of the reason why India finds it such a soup is because we haven't done well with scientific thinking, data informing policy and so forth. Uh, I do not know if you're about to start on that course now. So that's my, my big worry that the track record is such that uh, having been part of several, for example, meetings at the government level and being asked to develop a universal health coverage plan in two hours for the, for the Department of Finance, you often wonder how one is ever going to impact policy unless there is a real crisis. Uh, and if it's not now, I don't know really. Priya, it has to come from the top. It can't come from us at some fundamental level. And that is a little bit, you know, when Asha was talking about how the communities um, kind of got together and she talked about boundaries spanning, it was really interesting to me because Asha, sometimes when I've had these conversations, I've heard this in the in context of, you know, how the women in the community, self-help groups, Asha's have got together and almost taken on an uh, unprecedented burden of managing the pandemic. Uh, I almost feel like this is unfair, right? Like we're not compensating people for their time and their efforts in the spirit of volunteerism. And that, uh, uh, to me, if that happens a lot, then maybe there is a certain amount of, uh, you know, somebody else talked about the lethargy or the inertia in the system. Does the inertia also get fed by this kind of uh, reliance on uh, the spirit of volunteerism? I don't know if that's the context. Is, is that accurate for South Africa? Maybe not. But th this is a sense I get from here, at least. So uh, maybe two points on that. One, the health system has always relied on the unpaid or lowly paid uh, labor of women. Um, the health workforce is very skewed. And I think a crisis like this just highlight how much we need to change that. We need to invest in our listening to health workers. And I, re I really appreciate Rajini being the first presenter and looking at how in India has, in the last 15 years, built the ASHA program. And notwithstanding the criticisms of the ASHA program, it is miles ahead of some of the other programs around the world. Um, and there's a lot to learn from that. 
So that it is unfair, but I also think we can't leave everything to government. And yes, government must be held accountable. But if we were, you know, some things can't wait. And if if in Cape Town we had waited for government to respond, people would have starved. And it's this, you know, in Nepal under crisis, communities we have there is also agency and resources in communities. And I think that we have to look at what can enable them to respond. It, there is a larger, it is, I'm not saying that it's, it's uh, fair, but I also think waiting for, I don't know what the expression is, the horse to come to the pond of water to drink, you know, or the mountain to move um, is also could lead to even worse consequences. Um, and I think the opening is from these different ways of working, can that lead? Can that lead to an emboldening at local levels, at subnational district levels, to do something different? Especially because when at higher levels things are blocked, India is not unlike countries. And I know Indians might not want to think this, but look at Uganda, where you have had a, a, a national at national level politics is really bad. But that doesn't mean that you can't change things at district subnational level. And the same thing in India, there are um, pockets of what places and you have to look at those islands and strengthen those as well. Um, and that's also what resilience is about. It's not about abdicating state responsibility, but it's not waiting for some magical transformation at a higher level when there are things we can still respond to at the moment. Krishna, maybe you, if other panelists have any comments on this discussion, this particular discussion, it would be interesting. Otherwise, yeah, I, would... I have to respond to that because I lived in Gaza for a year and a half. And in Gaza, there was no government. And so, uh, yes, the community was responding, but it's a highly inefficient response. You see, the point is the communities can only take so much. And so at some level, issues of coordination economies of scope, literally speaking, are only going to come from governments. Now, whether it's the state government, the local government, or the national one, I have no problem with that. But I don't think we can rely on communities to, to bear the burden of this. I think it's going to be an awfully hard road down the road so the, to, to manage it, to be honest with you. But that's, you know, that's my opinion. Let me uh, uh, turn this question to Sridhar, because yeah. uh, I do take your point on, on Gaza not having a government and so why will be the burden of, of cre creating accountability on people is a lot. But what if you have a place like Bihar where you do have a government? Uh, maybe it's not a very strong government, but it does exist. So in a context like Bihar, uh, uh, is there a role for, for communities to, uh, to create or at least bring about some sort of accountability uh, 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 in, in, in government uh, towards resilient uh, health system? Shreder, over to you. I don't think there's any second question on that, second opinion on that. I mean, communities have a very critical role to play, no question about that. We are particularly, particularly the self-help groups and the way that, for example, the current government has been responding to them and nurturing them. There is, in fact, an active uh, political interest also in uh, nurturing uh, community groups, particularly women, uh, women's groups to uh, in some way uh, take, take take charge of their own lives, etc. And then um, empowered. I think there is a very strong movement towards that, at least compared to several other states. So I think there's something to be said for uh, the, this, the state trying to actually get people to participate in this. Uh, and I'm not saying it's, 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 it's extremely powerful, but at least it's there. The, the, the alcohol ban, for example, in the state came about because women demanded that. And in rural areas, it continues to be effective, whatever the problems are, are in the urban areas. So there, there are obviously ways in which, it, but the problem you see is what is it that communities can possibly hold government accountable for? They can hold government accountable for something, something gross. Did the AM turn up? Was vaccination provided? Did the Anganwadi worker give out the rations? 
they are they, they, they that mechanism is insufficient to improve system efficiencies in terms of quality whether the quality of care in a hospital was adequate or not other, other than what is grossly missing so i don't think that can really replace internal accountability it can only bolster it from outside uh, and uh, internal accountability is also not something that you uh, that I mean, the way at least currently in most states internal accountability is implemented is top down almost humiliating for the next level of uh, the workers whoever they might be and that that goes top to bottom how do you change that how do you actually say we look we respect you you are professionals in your own right and you can actually make a difference and these are the problems you need to solve these are the resources go ahead we are backing you how do you change the dialogue that happens between uh, higher level leadership at each level and lower level i think that is going to determine effectiveness of accountability accountability is not just about saying okay you were supposed to do it why did you not it, it's 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 actually about saying please feel empowered to solve problems priya uh, i'll hand it over to you now in case uh, you have any final thoughts I think the discussion was just getting to where we needed it to be and I wish there was a part 2 but Asha just said something in the chat which I thought was really important I think probably the role of civil society is helping broker these two systems but I again think trust in all institutions of public institutions um in order to have constructive civic dialogues is also important so you know uh, I it that I think the breakdown of trust in public systems and public institutions um is really uh, I I do think one of the indicators of lack of resilience in my mind and I I really want to just appreciate what all the speakers said and um you know about the nimbleness the learning the role of data trust issues of um, accountability a lot of the issues that have come up in this conversation will be continued as continuing threads through the conference so thank you all as panelists krishna as a moderator and discussant thank you for those who joined today and um, i think it was an important conversation and i think we'll continue to have it in different forums over the next tomorrow as well as next week in the uh, conference so thanks everybody and rohan is there anything that you would like to say as we close Uh, so in fact the next plenary uh, starts in about 15 minutes from now at 6 pm uh, and it's going to be about this first piece uh, that dr ved uh, spoke to us about uh, it's going to be about frontline workers and trying to understand how one uh, draws uh, or how one begins to balance between immediate needs and long term systems strengthening uh, we'll have a uh, opm uh, and and the team that's been working on frontline workers from there presenting uh, some of their work as well as the work of a working group that was part of the coordinate uh, uh coordinate community uh, and along with that we'll have uh, dr sonia trikha who's uh, from the shsrc uh, dr tanmay mahapatra from care india uh, bhanupriya rao from behen box as well as dr preeti uh, preeti john from the chitkara university will be moderating the session so that should be quite exciting and and a good follow up to this i guess because hopefully some of this also gets captured there uh more details on the cornet website you can follow conversations we are live tweeting on cornet uh, underscore india and uh, if any of you are researchers uh, and would be keen to join this community of practice please write to us at hello.cornet.in uh, hello@cornet.in yep i'll i'll stop with that thanks very much for joining us